Well, folks, we are back. We are recording live from the south coast of England, from the ancient kingdom of Wessex. I'm Patrick Lynch, your host, and with our esteemed author guest, Irish author and artiste, Thomas Sheridan. It's my absolute pleasure to welcome you back to the Free Truth Show. Mr. Sheridan, are you with us? I am indeed, Patrick, and I'm delighted to be here. Ah, uh, good man. We've been covering the history of the occult in Germany and um, we've been delving back into history a lot further and trying to piece together how nations are consolidated and the occult power is consolidated through the magic of the occult, secret societies and various groups and the propaganda um, by means of art and namely music and painting and um, the pressure that the, the pressure that's exerted on the mind of soldiers to be um, automatons as you say yeah. uh, in and fighting machines in the, from the Prussian time um, right back to the Spartans we mentioned and um, we're at the point I believe we left at the point where Hitler is a young man, um, Adolf Hitler is a young man, he's already um, being taught by the New Templar Order, uh, according to Fritz Springmeier, uh, another author who writes about the bloodlines of the Illuminati, and uh, various other authors, uh, various other orders, the Vril group, the, uh, the Tool or Fool Society will come to, I'm sure, and yep. um, so Hitler is a young man, he's, he's um, destitute, he's gone through the war, he's been no shirker during the World War I, he's, he's loving it, he's, uh, he's come yes. out and he's very disappointed. And you were talking about the manipulation. Well, let's go back to the trenches on the Western, on the Western Front. Yeah. You have Adolf Hitler who's, by all accounts, actually enjoying warfare as a little boy would. Yeah. In the sense that it's a it's the first great adventure of his life, he seems by all accounts to have come out of his shell. He's met he's made friends. He's very highly thought of by his officers and his fellow soldiers. Yeah, uh, and he's stuck in the trenches and nothing is happening. There is stagnation. The mm -hmm. elite powers of Europe are not moving troops. They're just dying in the mud. He sends them over the top now and again. And it's the most appalling version of an industrial war of attrition. It's a war of just pure murder and carnage, and nothing happens. Adolf Hitler, by all accounts, was an exemplary soldier in the military, in his Bavarian regiment. Knight's Cross. Not Iron Cross, not only for his heroic, his valour, but also his humanity towards captured prisoners. He arrested a British machine gun post without killing them. Uh, took them back, made sure they got fed, water, and given their uh, first aid. And he was seen as a model soldier. Then what happens is Germany and the Allied powers decide to have call a armistice. Now, an armistice was just basically not so much an end of a war, but a kind of a respite to decide how we're going to finish the war. Nobody won. Nobody lost. This is going nowhere. Let's just stop the fighting. Send the soldiers home and we'll have another treaty once again just outside Paris. hundred years later after the Treaty of Paris, which ended the Napoleonic Wars, and set up the mercantile class of Europe. And where was the League of Nations set up? 1919 at the Versailles Palace. Paris. Well, yep. Uh, and anyway, what happened then was it gets really interesting. The Germans go home, Adolf Hitler had, was recovering from injuries in the war, it was a gas attack I believe. He's in his hospital in Munich and word comes through that Germany has been forced into a surrender by the British and the French and the Americans. So Germany, which did not technically lose the war, had the ability to go and fight on, had a standing excellent army very well trained, more than willing to fight, very high discipline, were told that they had lost, even though they hadn't. This was deliberately done to drive the Germans insane. 
imagine that. Like, you didn't lose the war, but you're the side who's not only told that you have to lose it, but you're the one who has to pay back the other guys mm -hmm. for war damages. Incidentally, uh, if I may interject, um, Fritz Springmeier mentions that um, whilst in hospital, suffering from the gas attack, uh, Hitler was um, hypnotised for, um, for his role in the future. I disagree. I, I'm not saying it didn't happen. That's Mr. Springmeier's speculation. I've read his book, it's true, and it's, 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 it's quite good, but I don't believe that's what happened. I believe what happened to Adolf Hitler was the same thing that happened to Frederick II following the, uh, witnessing the murder of his, his lower man, Kepa. I believe, it's actually well documented that Hitler had a psychedelic experience, not the first one in his life, it was actually the second. The previous one was when he first laid eyes on the spirit of destiny in Vienna. He went into a psychedelic state, a psychedelic hysteria, and came out of it. Now this is when it gets really interesting. This is my tie in with Fritz Springmeier's uh, theory. Someone in the barracks noticed that this guy, Hitler, was going through this stage. Now, he may have been planned for it. I've seen no proof that Hitler was a Rothschild. When you look and you dig into it, this very, it's a lot of speculation. There's not a lot of hard proof. It could be possible. I haven't seen it. Yes, his grandmother did work in the Rothschild house in Vienna, and she did become pregnant, but there's no proof. And also, there's a... His name may not even be Hitler. It's a usually... Heidler. Uh, yeah, Heidler. It's a usually messed up family tree and for lots of reasons so to actually say that hitler was a rothschild i i believe is actually a massive extrapolation but at the same time it could be true i'm not scouting other people's things i'm just going to what i was able to dig up and there's some very good research on the hitler family that basically they just appear out of nowhere in the 1850s in in a rural uh, in outside Linsen in a near in Austria, and they definitely had changed their name probably for uh, through a marriage or something like that. But there's no Jewish anything in them. Yeah, I am talking about another author here, if you'll forgive me. But um, yeah. Fritz Springmeier says that in his book Bloodlines of Illuminati, then came Hitler. According to Walter Langer, a psychoanalyst who wrote the book of the Mind of Adolf Hitler. Um, the German leader was a grandson of Rothschild. He wrote that Adolf's father, Alois Hitler, Alois, yes. Alois, Alois Hitler, was the illegitimate son of Maria Anna uh, Schickelgruber. It was supp generally supposed that the father of Alois Hitler was Johann Jörg Heidler. Hitler, Heidler. Yes. And do you remember Jörg Heider in the 90s, the Austrian Freedom Party? Again, yes. that was Heider, wasn't it? But there yeah. are some people who seriously doubt that Johann Jörg Heidler was the father of Alois. But she yeah, was just... living in Vienna at the time she conceived, and at the time she was a servant in the home of Baron Rothschild. And, um, and he, had a, he, he was known for having his way with the ladies, with the chambermaids. So, yeah, yeah. So, so it's not outside the bounds of possibility, but I'm not going to just jump in and say it because one and two guys, one guy's based on a book by someone else, it's absolutely true. I'm just setting back and saying... It's one of a number of possibilities. Yeah, I mean, if there was a police record that we could refer yeah. to that she was raped, yeah. etc. Yeah. Yeah. the records, that'd be one thing. But apparently the birth certificates and all the marriage certificates are all messed up. And this, this leads to a problem, and that's where speculation tends to go overboard. But it could be true. It could be true. Uh, please continue. You were talking about the uh, psychedelic experiences. So he came out of psychedelic experience, and just like... Just like Frederick II, he was changed. He suddenly showed an interest in nationalism and national politics, where it came out of nowhere. Prior to that, he could have went anyway. He could have been a socialist, he could have been a communist, he could have went anyway. He wanted to be an artist, yeah? Architect, yeah, he wanted to be an artist and an architect and also a stage designer. And he was actually a very ambitious person in his youth. This is why I don't believe he was a psychopath. I think he was made psychopathic over what was what happened. He became proto-psychopathic, right? He wasn't definitely, absolutely, wasn't a natural-born psychopath. Now, uh, by all accounts, he was quite a decent, likable person up until what we're getting to now. Well, that's who the elite loved to turn to the dark side, you know? The innocent, yeah. the, the good. Perhaps he was a good ma man when he was 10 or 15 years old or something, but they loved to twist innocence, you know? 
I think is I think it could be some truth to that. So anyway, he comes out of hospital and he's 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 unemployed. He's basically hasn't been fully discharged from his regiment, but he's basically living there because he's got nowhere else to go. He's delivering speeches on the the criminality of what he called the central criminals in in Berlin, who acquiesced to the treaty. Uh, tremendous uh, anger among the German military, and then a group of communists called the Russians, uh, called the Spartacus, composed of Russians and Polish, Jew, mainly Jews, Rosa Luxemburg being the most uh, the most well-known of them, tried to implement a Soviet-style revolution, first in Berlin, but it spread through all the cities. This happened in the spring of 1919. Sorry, it was sorry. Yeah, no, it was, it was it was late winter, nineteen nineteen. The initial revolution. This is this is like this is gonna this blows my mind. Amore, I think this. Uh, the Spartacus revolution failed because there was still plenty of heavily armed troops from a group called the Prussian Free Corps, who were unemployed troops who still had their weapons and their heavy artillery and equipment. Yes. They descended upon the uh, the, the Spartacus revolution. And then they basically wiped them out. They murdered, uh, they murdered Rosa Luxemburg, anyone else, to, and they, they ended the revolution very quickly. They were trying to make to, to fight a Bolshevik revolution at all costs. Quite rightly, I might add. It lingered on sporadically until the Reds, and this is when it really gets important. The Reds had recruited a, a bunch from Russia, mainly Russian Jews, and this is so, this leads you so much to the where the anti-Semitism fostered. Descended on Munich, the, the local Reds formed a militia and declared a Bavarian Soviet. This happened on Valpurgis night, the night of the when the witches take flight and visit, visit the, the demon king in the mountains. Mm. 1919, April 30th, into Beltane, May 1st. High ritual occultic dates yes what they did was quite astounding and shocking they implemented a brutal soviet inside bavaria uh, under the most appalling the worst aspects of of communism so uh, you could act bolshevism you can imagine they spoke about deliberately starving the babies of the bourgeoisie, all this kind of thing. And you had these Russian, this Russian intellectual jury, uh, jury standing there delivering orations in Russian accents, to, telling the Germans they were free in Bavaria. Of course, nobody liked this bunch of foreigners coming in. They also liberated German Russian prisoners from a local POW camp, gave them guns. These poor bastards who were not really involved and stuck them in as revolutionary guards. They went on a reign of terror around Munich and Bavaria. And this culminated in April 30th, on the morning of April 30th, 1919, Valpurgis night, where members of an occult organization called the Thula, the Thula Society, yeah. were, to, were taken into, by the Reds, into the Spartacus, into a... A gymnasium in a school and they were shot seven of them one of them included a Jewish professor so it would. the society had two high-ranking members who were both aristocrats Prince Thurn sorry Prince von Thurn und Paxis and Countess von Westharp these were very high socially ranking German aristocrats. They were shot dead with dum-dum bullets, which are horrific. Uh, they basically explode the body to bits yeah. in the gymnasium, deliberately done to antagonize the Prussian Free Corps who were descending on the city in captured British tanks, World War One tanks, and their own equipment emblazoned with runes, skull and crossbone designs, and rudimentary versions of the National Socialist Swastika. At the head of this group called the Thule Combat, the Thule Combat League, was a young aristocrat named Rudolf Hess. Aha, yes, a known Thule Society member. Also a known occultist going right back to his yeah. time in, in Egypt at the same time. Crowley, 
was writing the Book of the Law. He was also heavily involved in Parisian occult societies. They descended on the city on foul porches as, as, as almost like witches, and they absolutely hammered the shit out of the site Spartacus. Their bravery and their fearlessness, you're talking about Rudolf Hess running into the street with at the head of the Tool Combat League, along with Ernst Van Roll, as bullets were whizzing past them, taking out red machine gun positions, fearless. They just, the, the, the Russian Bolsheviks all snuck off back to Russia, and all the locals, the Russian prisoners that they liberated, quote-unquote liberated, were all taken into, into, into quarries outside the city, city and machine gun. The cruelty was barbaric. So um, Hess displayed the same kind of characteristics that the, the automatons of the Prussian military had. Yeah, he was a Prussian aristocrat, and that's mm -hmm. extremely important in this whole story. Yeah. The, by Beltane, the revolution, the Spartacus revolution, the next day was overthrown, and the Thula Society, out of the Four Seasons Hotel, where they were running, basically a paramilitary IRA slash occult style operation, sending guns out and propaganda and occult literature began running Bavaria in, as basically an occult administration. And immediately things got better and it left a great impression on the on the uh, the locals. They were much they were treated much, they were treated much better by Germans than they were by the, the Reds. And so the Bolsheviks had been finally routed out of Germany at that point, although there were still, you know, socialist factions that were very strong. The, a couple of weeks later, a seance was held in the Four Seasons Hotel by the Thula Society members. And this is officially on the record. I was going to ask two, about that, yeah. It's in two books. It's in Hammer of the Gods, which was a, a, a academic thesis by David Lur Essen. It's also in The Psychopathic God by Adolf Hitler. And it's in a few other books that don't... I, can, I haven't got them right now, Al. but this has been well documented, left out of most of the history books put as a sideline. They held a, a seance in the hotel, and to their amazement, which almost caused, caused uh, Guido, uh, almost caused some of the members to run out of the, uh, the, the hotel in terror, the disembodied spirits manifested of Prince uh, von Thurn on Taxis and Countess van Westa appeared in front of the Thule Society seance members and speaking in Plattendeutsch, which is Old Saxony, the pre-Germanic tongue of the Prussian Empire, the, 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 the dialect of the ancient Germanic Teutonic tribes, told that the Freya Christus, Christus the Germanic Aryan saviour, was about to arrive and appear in, in, in Bavaria, in Munich, and would bring Germany to salvation. But it came with a warning. The channel, the two ghost spirits also said that he would lead Germany to its destruction. Literally within days, Adolf Hitler walked into the Four Seasons Hotel, and within a couple of weeks, in fact, on September 11th, 1919, <laughs> was given orders from the head of his Bavarian regiment that he was to infiltrate a meeting at a pub on the right. Tal yeah, in Central right. Music of the German, a, an upcoming party called the German Workers' Party, mm -hmm. and he was to just monitor him as a spy. When he got there, yeah. a Bavarian professor delivered a speech saying that the whole Germany is, is fecked and we basically, the only way forward is to declare a Bavarian Democratic Republic. Hitler rose to his feet and delivered an oration that stunned everybody present by both its you know, articulate, insightful, politically astute and with an extreme sense of confidence in a language that they'd never heard to the point where their hair stood on the back of their necks, and that was the birth of Adolf Hitler as the risen Freya Christus, the Witch King of Germany, 
and it began with that speech on September 12th now, in the town in a pub. In he order, in, in order to give, in, sorry, what, what was that last bit? I interrupted. He instantly captivated people. Mm. In order to give credibility to uh, your messiah, if you're a secret society, would you invent these um, amazing events to consolidate and convince people that this was your man and get behind him? Yes, but that I do. Uh, but they also they kept that stuff for the Thula Society quite quiet. That's what's interesting about it. They did not push it out there. Hmm. This was actually discovered okay. years later through archival documents. So it wasn't something that they, although there was much talk in 1919 and 1918 in Bavaria of the arrival of the Germanic Christ. Yeah. So there's two aspects to it. It was a whispering kind of thing. Our and same, what year was this? 21 or 22, something? This was the 1919. September 19. 11, 1919 was when he got the orders to go to the pub on the foul and to spy on behalf of his Bavarian regiment. Mm -hmm. Within a couple of days, he had resigned from the army and joined the German Workers' Party. Yeah. He was, spying, he, he, he was spying for the government originally. Yeah, but he was so yeah. impressed by what he saw and the people he encountered. I read that, that yeah. Yeah, that he wanted a piece of the action. And that was the beginning of the National Socialist Movement. It began in a pub in Bavaria. Now, it's it's amazing when it then is the, then as things develop, the party grows quite quite slowly at first. But he had already consolidated people like uh, Ernst Röhm and Rudolf Hess. I believe Rudolf Hess was actually Adolf Hitler's handler. I believe the relationship with him was far more complex than just. You know, even academic historians talk about the relationship as sort of like an, a friendship of affection. It mm. was actually, it was actually deeper than that. I believe that he was his mind control handler. The Rudolf Hess, with his occult training, was the mind control handler of Adolf Hitler. That's why things went to shit after he ran to England. Mm. And he landed in his plane in England on, on a lord's estate. Was it a lord's estate? An aristocratic yeah. estate? Of all the places yeah. to land, you know. You know, there's a great uh, Henry Irving, the controversial historian, does a, has a phenomenal book on Rudolf Hess, which goes wonderfully into into that. But da anyway, da David David Irving was it? David, David Irving. Sorry, <laughs> I'm getting confused. Yeah, I, 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 I remember because I was talking about him today. Yeah. No, no, I, rem I remember in the '90s how how he was so vilified, and I was disgusted at him denying the Holocaust, and this is d disgusting, you know, and disgraceful, you know. But subconsciously, or he kind of often wondered why the media was attacking this one man, this, this um, allegedly esteemed historian, you know. And uh, yeah, it, it never quite sat right with me, but I accepted it, you know. Yeah, well, he did sort of become a... Uh, he did sort of become a... Uh, controversial and and so and, and so forth. I don't, I, I don't know enough about that stuff to know if he's right or wrong. But unfortunately... It's, it sort of distracted from the fact that his his other academic and his other historical research was phenomenal. Mm, yeah. As you tell people, it's a fantastic. So maybe book it was, maybe they were deflecting attention away from his, his occult findings or uh, uh, or the fact that he was just such a good. Or, no, I think in fact he humanized people. He actually humanized. Instead of he took these German leaders and instead of them portrayed as cartoon monsters, actually showed they were complex, which is what I have discovered: complex, dynamic men. And women, yeah, and, and we're not, and certainly not like the like the characters. We're going to get to that now. The characters portrayed in the Charlie Chaplin film, the the Great Dictator. Mm -hmm. There's a pivotal scene in that film, the Great Vic Dictator, where they show the. Uh, well, it's what happened basically was as the as the German Workers Party grew and Hitler started to develop people uh, develop this kind of I wouldn't say cult. But following around him, they by 1923 they were, it already had nearly 16,000 members. I mean that's how fast things really began. But this was happening at, because of the mainly because Germany was falling apart economically. Their main their main banks had collapsed. There was you know there's still the grievances regarding the the Versailles Treaty. Uh, one of the most infuriating and disgusting things that were done to the German people is American banks, American and French banks, 
provided what they called humanitarian loans under the League of Nations to Germany. They were not humanitarian loans, they were dirty IMF kind of uh, bailouts. Oh, that sounds familiar. Yeah, uh, and which they had to pay back with interest and were told, oh, we're doing you a favour. Everything was done. But then something happened. As the German Workers' Party, the National Socialist Workers' Party, the National Socialist Democratic Workers' Party, as it was changing its name, towards 1923, there is a film. It is a film made by Alof, uh, Charlie Chapman called The Great Dictator, which basically makes fun of fascists, and it's quite good. But there's one scene in that film that's completely historically inaccurate. It is the, and it's also something that's portrayed even in contemporary history books as a joke. Anything but that. It was one of the most powerful magical rituals ever, ever performed. And that was the, what they called the Munich Push. Oh, the Putsch, yeah. Yeah, which they, which is referred to as the beer Putsch or the drunken Putsch. It's always they're always portrayed as flapping fat Germans flapping around on the streets of Munich, drunk with a beer in their hand, a Steiner beer in their hand. You know, while they're all, it, it was a big mess. It was. Oh, really Hitler was shocked in that, wasn't he? A couple of times. It was, no, he wasn't hit, though. Uh, this is what's so amazing. Uh, what happened was, the, the basically, the, there was a meeting. The, the, because of the political and financial crisis, there was a meeting being held in a very large beer, beer cellar in the center of Munich with the, basically the, the, the commissioner of Bavaria and a few other people. Hitler and about 500 brown shorts who had a machine gun. The brown shorts already existed by this point, the SA went in with a machine gun, surrounded the beer keller, and Hitler stood on a table, and beside the commissioner was a guy called Gustav von Kahr. He, it was, he, put, he fired a revolver into the ceiling and said the national revolution has broken out. Jumped off the table and went up and spoke in a very casual and respectful way with the attendees the, the, from central government and the Bavarian central government that this was a revolution, it's in your interest to join us, and we're raising, uh, we're going to overthrow the central, the criminals in central government. Are you with us? They hesitate. They hesitated. They didn't give any kind of conviction one way or another. Hitler casually, in front of hundreds of people, ordered a glass of beer, drank it, thought about it for a second, and very ritualistically smashed the beer glass onto the ground which shattered into thousands of pieces which people ran and gathered up like they were holy relics this was a mind control spell this was building up the whole idea of Hitler as being a god hmm. Hitler went back at night and told them the next morning they were going to march on the city centre raise a national movement and then move to a march similar to Mussolini's march on Rome, which inspired it, towards Berlin and arrest the criminals in central government because of what, they're, what they had done to the nation. The next day, oh, November 11th, by the way, 9-11 <laughs> again, 11-9, yeah. yeah. Hitler at the fore, alongside his own people, which is people who become household names today, such as von Rome, which is von Rome and uh, Hess, Marched down Rome, to the central, yes. and Himmler, marched down the central street, and at the, they were told that they deliberately went by the war memorial to invoke as much sort of energetic magic as possible, because people were still, you know, there were still grievances over the war and the treatment of Germany. Stupidly, or it was planned, the militia fired on them. Bullet, and with Hitler front and center, the bullets crashed into people all around them, killing them. And he was portrayed in academic books and even in a Charlie Chaplin film as jumping to the ground and hiding behind a man's body. That's not what happened at all. The man standing next to Hitler was instantly shot dead. He made a dead man's grip and he grabbed the lapel of Hitler's trench coat. And you know, a dead man is so unbelievably strong, pulled Hitler to the ground. And Hitler was on the ground while the bullets were flying around him. Eventually, the, the fighting stopped. Hitler got up. They were eventually all arrested and they were sent to Landsberg prison. Now, this was almost like an alchemical gestation. He made the, the, the actual... He was the actual in, he was in, he, he, didn't he share a cell with Hess? You say he was yeah. a handler. 
Yeah, said. they shared, oh, this is when it gets, I mean, this story, mm. just, as I said, I was saying the breakdown, this, it, 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 people need to study this history because it is a fantastic stu- subject to study. It, you, it is, you, yeah. It just, it's just so interesting. So the trial was, Matt, was phenomenal in itself. Hitler played the, the Freya crisis in the court. He invoked the spirits of Germans to rise up from the dead. It was pure theatre, pure Wagner, pure alchemy. And then he went to Landsberg prison with Hess and the rest of the leading national socialists to gestate. While he was in there, both him and Hess wrote Mein Kampf. Yeah, my struggle. Nine, a, a baby was born, a magical baby. There's, now, your, my, there's your Messiah's Bible, yeah. Yeah, a, a, a magical baby was born. The, the child of this ritual that took place in Munich in November 11th and the 12th. He came out <coughs> with Mein Kampf and the book was trashed by everybody outside Germany. People inside Germany couldn't get enough of it. It intoxicated. It was a spell-bounding, spell-binding manifesto of the German soul in transition. And yet when people read it in other countries, they thought it was a load of crap. It was a bombastic ravings of a madman. Mm. But they had forgotten something. On the eve of World War Two, British intelligence gave original copies of Mein Kampf to German-speaking agents and told them to read it with a German consciousness. And it soon became apparent that Mein Kampf was written as a magical text that would actually tap into the archetypal core of the Teutonic soul. And the, far from it being bombastic and the ravings of a madman, in Plattendutsch, the Germanic ancient Saxon, Germanic, yeah. it was spellbinding. It was mystical. It it infused the reader with a sense of magical destiny. And in much the same way as modern rock albums were, um, uh, when they were pressed, they'd perform a ritual. Perhaps that's what they did when it was published or printed, you know? The mastering. Well, it's an interesting story in that. The original editor was a Jesuit priest. Here we go. Uh huh. And uh, they had him murdered soon afterwards. <laughs> they were you. They want. They want the Jesuitical language to specifically because the Jesuits were the masters of what we early versions of neuro-linguistic programming. Mm-hmm. You know, they talk about like James Joyce. Uh, you know, Book Mulligan and James Joyce's Ulysses talks about. You know, yeah. You, you know, he talks about James Joyce's Jesuitical spellbinding and things like that. Yeah, I saw your piece about the the castle where Ulysses was written that he shared. Yeah. That uh, James Joyce shared with the Oliver Saint John Gocty. Yeah, yeah. So it was the same. The Jesuits sent, so they brought a Jesuit and they killed him off after he edited it. And <laughs> a mysterious, a mysterious well, story in itself. The, the Nazis were anything but you know anything. If anything, they were consistent. You know. uh, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, and they didn't, thanks they, Ernst Rom with the Night of the Long Knives. Thanks for the uh, thanks for the memories. Well, yeah. Well, the, oh, but that's an interesting story. But that's in, that's in Val Porges Night Volume Two. And so anyway, uh, Hitler, it's it, it just an amazing thing, comes out, and this book literally, you now you try to put your, so what happened was on the eve of World War Two, and I'm jumping the gun here, when the intelligence services in Britain read this book, they went, oh my God, now we finally realize what we're up against. Mm-hmm. We're up against literally a supernatural army with an infused sense of Teutonic uh, Regalness, chivalry, and weren't the Germans, especially the SS units, they were fanatical and uh, they were, automatons. They were, they were, they were, yeah, they were a religious order based on the, the, the ancient Germanic knights, the Teutonic knights. Yeah, yeah, except they weren't Christian; they were pagans. So the, the the Nazis were very clever. They tapped into both sides of the archetype: Teutonic warrior archetype and the ancient Saxon Teutonic uh, pagan archetype. Well, the um, according to uh, sorry to keep relating back to this, but for me it's one of the best sources. Um, apparently, 
Hitler carried out blood sacrifices to open his mind to high level demonic spiritual control Fritz Springmeier yes that's what the murder of his, uh, his, his niece Scaly Rubin was he had murdered his niece in Munich after before while it was during a thing called Hitler over Germany which was the campaign for the 1932 elections uh, his, uh, his niece was found shot with a bullet in her heart uh, Hitler almost certainly was a blood sacrifice because when Hitler was arrested by the Munich police who were actually pro-national socialists at the time taken down to the police station he was very the alchemical stuff was all over this or, sorry the cold stuff was all over this he mm -hmm. said that Gailey was involved in a in a, a seance group, a mystical spiritual group, and she had had an ad experience there at this mystical group, this seance, where her death was foretold, and she would not live much longer, and she went into a hysterical state, and that's why she committed suicide. The reality was she was almost certainly a blood sacrifice in the Teutonic sense. I see, which yeah. The Saxons right back to the Teutonic tribes, of his niece, for him to attain power, who was the person who was closest to him in his life. Hitler is known to have taken both, and with Eric Rome, as David Irving talks about, how after the light of the long knives, Hitler was depressed over what happened, then took a ritual bath, <clears throat> and cleansed himself, and after the ritual bath, he was perfectly fine. He was, it's, all, it's been known in occult circles, that you can remove a demon from yourself by taking a bath or taking a shower because the demons now and I know we're going to other places here but let's assume that demons are aspects of the psyche and not necessarily demons like yeah. we have it yeah. so, but they could be they could be we're talking that's just like the gym so yes very very dark stuff was going on as national socialism increased the especially as the 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 culture of the of the Teutonic societies, the magical societies, such as the orders of the Templars, were then incorporated into the military. Well, now the SS were not the military; they were basically a police force who to assume major control after the Night of the Long Knives. But they were these were sort of like supernatural knights. This is why they carried wounds and death heads and mm -hmm. skull and crossbones. The same reason that George Bloody Bloody Bush and the the Skull and Bone Society at Yale use it. They're all connected. They're all and, and there was genuine infighting between the SA and the various groups, the SS. There was a struggle, a genuine struggle for power between them, hence the Night of the Long Knives, where they killed a, a, up to a thousand people in one night. To, but that kind of, um, that strength and blood and honour kind of uh, competition was encouraged by Hitler himself. That oh yeah, it was, you, the, it, was, it was the SS who murdered the... Uh, the SA. Uh huh. This was, um, this was a ritual. This was a magic, a blood rite. Right. As as, and just just uh, going on to a, a a very broad topic here. But I mean, war itself. Would you say, is war itself or major battles? Are they blood sacrifice rituals? Yes, and that's why they make such a big deal out of regalia. You know, you had the Nazis mm -hmm. had the ritual of the blood banner. The blood banner was the barrier carried in Munich in nineteen uh, in the nineteen twenty three. The, the flag, the, yeah. yeah, yeah, and that was actually touched every other brown short or SS uh, military banner. Yeah, it was soaked, it, wasn't it soaked in the blood of the people who fell on the Munich Putsch? And, exactly. This yeah. is why you have like. And then they would the parade it every year. Yeah. You go to the Imperial War Museum Museum in London and you see the, the French <clears> eagles <throat> and all the other captured insignia. These are magical ritual devices that are charged with a certain uh, energy. So in They're medieval times, action. in medieval times, if you captured the banner, you know, you you hoist, hoist it aloft, and much it, the same well, way. In, in the Napoleonic a, Wars, if you captured it, if you were a British soldier and you captured a an eagle, a French uh, regimental eagle, you were, yeah. you, would be, you would be a millionaire. You would be like a rock star. You would be like uh, David Beckham. Right, yeah. You, you, you would be set for life. You would be a superstar. You'd have all the women and all the money you'd ever want. <laughs> and that's what, that's, that's what, that's what that, that came from the Romans, actually. The, and that came from the Teutons as well, and the, the, the Gallic tribes trying to capture Roman eagles. Yeah, and, see, that, and, all, that, and that... It all repeats through history. Oh, well, and now just, we see it in the... In, are, now, 
No. They are rituals. In Dublin, there's the Wellington Monument, which is the largest obelisk in Europe. Only the uh, one in Washington, D.C. is taller. Yeah, I held Obviously, a rally there, would you believe? <laughs> the, one, the one in Dublin? Yeah. Do you see those friezes of all the Napoleonic uh, yeah. battles around the side? Mm -hmm. They're actually made from the cannons, and they've got the cannonballs yeah. that were captured at Waterloo and melted down. And, and there, isn't that, Doesn't that thing have the most dark energy? It when I was do, a kid, yeah. I was terrified of it. Well, it wasn't a successful rally. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a kind of step pyramid. I held a, a no world order rally there. That was my per first public sort of protest. About 50 of us turned up. And I, I travelled over to Dublin to, to demonstrate and raise awareness about the new world order generally. And um, it's a very dark, imposing monument. It's a, it's a stepped pyramid for a star. Yeah. Um, it's enormous. It's it's enormous. It's on a stepped pyramid, like uh, like Stalin's tomb is a stepped pyramid. Um, sorry, Lenin's tomb, and this 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 monolithic uh, Cleopatra needle. Um, it's it is seems it, it's taller than the Washington Monument, is it? No, it's smaller. It's the tallest one in Europe. Only the Washington Monument is bigger. Ah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it's the same general idea. It's built out to, you know, Masonic things. It's got the whole Masonic setup, and it's infused with the death energy of the uh, the men killed at Waterloo into the fabric of the the bronze friezes. So it's in, when I was a kid, I used to I, I was I used to practice my football by kicking the football up the side of the steps because it would always come back down to you. Yeah. <laughs> so it was a really good for football training. Yeah. So on a Sunday night, I might be the only kid there in, say, August at like nine, ten o'clock at night, and it was still bright. But not everyone had gone home from the park, and it was just me and the midges. And I'd be kicking that football when I was about 13, 14, up those steps uh, as part of my, fo my football training. <laughs> and uh, I can tell you, some nights I looked at those freezes, and I thought they were moving and looking at me. Creepy, eh? Creepy. Yeah. Probably designed that way when the light fades, you know. Yeah, and also the magical spell and the hypnotism they cause, and the shape of the pyramid and the shape of the obelisk. Very. If anyone goes over to Dublin, if you want to see a, a true Masonic occult black magic uh, edifice, go to the Phoenix Park and visit the Wellington Monument. Yeah, it's and it's in Phoenix Park. <laughs> it's in the Phoenix Park, yeah, yeah. In the Phoenix Park, the risen Phoenix. Yeah. It's it's amazing. It's just amazing. But anyway, that's I do believe that war is a giant energy harvest in rituals, as well as the coal, and that's why they keep the banners and the medals. They're all charged with the emotional in the very atom, the very subatomic fag fragment of these. This is why people still collect them on eBay to this day. There's a charge in them. There's a power in them, just like money has a charge and cash has a charge in the power of coins, the the, the 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 exchange of coin, the exchange of medals. It's all, it's all alchemy. It's all occult. It's all incredibly powerful. And yeah, that's true. And the Hitler and the Third Reich, and and National Socialism, perfected this, and brought it into the modern world in the rise to power. And that's what the book Valpurgis Night is about. And the second and third one will be about the growth of the Third Reich in the government, and the final one will be until 1945. But I may even do a book afterwards just talking about how the German experiment was then exported through the CIA Operation Paperclip. Yeah. And, and, through, and through the underground Swiss network, Templar networks out of the Vatican and the South America. I am now getting, this is, I'm not kidding, this is not a joke, Patrick. The, number, the most hits I'm getting on my website now are from places like Argentina, Paraguay, and Brazil. Why is that? And you know what's all down there? The surviving, the surviving national socialist communities. They're still mm. oh, down the there. Oh, the big German and Austrian communities, yeah. In our hundreds of thousands. Well, they're uh, not, it's, they, it, they're it, not small little communities. These are fully developed post 1945 Teutonic Germanic Prussian communities all well, over South America so they've definitely taken an interest in my work that's creepy isn't it yeah which shows that I've tapped into something here hmm just as um, it's a long broad subject and lots of speculation but did Hitler escape to Argentina in your opinion I 
think he did. It's very likely, isn't it? Uh, I think that's what the Wonder Weapon was. The Wonder Weapon was the Witch King escaping. And we all know the date that Hitler vanished. It was April 30th, 1945, Val Purgis night. Well, the there night you go. When the, witch, the Demon Kings take flight. Oh, my God. <laughs> wow. I told you it was an amazing subject. Oh, it you is, yeah. It, you just, you just, you literally have, you literally, you have your jaw hitting the floor, and I haven't even scratched the surface. 